Welcome everyone to Ask a Puppy Trainer Show live episode. Where are we? It doesn't say Kimberly. <gasps> I don't have an episode. 119. All right. We have Himiko with us. She is a Samoid and she is a baby baby. So we're going to see if we can get her to settle down a little bit. And I guess I'm going to have to use this as an example of how we get dogs at home to settle down too. So a lot of people want to hold their dogs in their laps, which is totally fine. You gotta see, you gotta understand though, not, not, not every dog wants to be held in a lap. So look at Himiko. She's fussy, she's moving around a lot. And I'm kind of for trying to find something for, oh, like my shoe for her to chew on and entertain herself. So if I did want to have this dog on my lap, very likely I'd have to kind of have her tucked under an arm like this so you can see me tucking under. I have my right hand on her left shoulder between her legs like that. So it's similar to my hold for little dogs, which is two fingers on the chest, one thumb on the outside, and my pinky on the outside over here. Obviously, it's not gonna work for her, she's too big. So I do a cross chest hold. It allows me to kind of hold, and right now I'm getting nipped at, she's biting at me. So when I get a lot of this nippiness, watch what I do with my arms, it's not gonna be a hard one, it's gonna be a firm, hey, settle down. Good, I got kisses instead. So I can't do that every single time my dog starts getting amped up and getting pumped, but as it, oh God, those ones hurt. <laughs> but right now, this is where the hand's coming in because she bit the hand. The hand didn't respond how she wanted to. She started looking for something else and I just kind of tightened up my hold a little bit. Hey, settle down. Good. And now she's starting to find a balance. But one thing I will say to all my owners, she's not going to last very long, Kimberly, but we'll see how long we get out of her. So one thing I say to all my owners is when you have a dog on your lap, what you pet is what you get. If I have a dog relaxed, calm, kind of how she is now, she's not actually calm, she's alert, but we're gonna pretend like she's calm. I'll get my hand on the back of the neck and I'll do like a deep pressure massage. Oh yeah, she's melting, melting into that hold. I got probably about two, three minutes of this before she starts getting overstimulated and a little bit more, more rambunctious, but I can massage this energy level. If I had her trying to nip at me, trying to jump up, licking my face, getting a little bit wild, I wouldn't even attempt to pet because if I pet that, I'm rewarding that level of energy. If I want a calm dog, I reward the calm moments. Like right here, hey, 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 settle down. I'm gonna start doing my deep pressure, melting into it again, beautiful. So this is kind of what we're looking for when we want a dog to settle. After those couple minutes on your lap when they start getting a bit more rambunctious, most of the time there's nothing you can get, do to settle them back down, at least not a dog this age. She's only like 12 weeks old, she's a baby baby. At that point, it's your job to be like, okay, we've had our couple minutes of cuddle time. Most puppies, that's all you really get. And now we say, let's put them down, put them on their cot, put them in the crate, put them in their house, whatever you guys want. So that's gonna be my cue to, here you go, Kimberly. We got two and a half minutes out of her. That's pretty good for a Samoan. These dogs are not cuddly, affectionate dogs. They tend to be more neutral dogs, um, herding mentality, um, independent mentality. So not every dog is built the same. Not every dog is gonna sit on the couch and cuddle. Like if I had a German Shepherd, they probably only got four or five minutes. If I had a Kevlar King Charles, which is literally like the royalty dog, they're meant to lay on laps for hours at a time. That's a dog that's just gonna melt and lay by your leg. Uh, La Suapso, Yorkie, you have a lot of different breeds that are not bred for it, but they have a calmer temperament and you're gonna be able to get that for a little bit longer. So just think about the dog you have and if you do wanna have a cuddler, make sure you get the breed that's more likely to be a cuddler. Not German Shepherds, not Border Collies, not any really heavy driven dog. Okay, to our questions. This is from Kogo. Okay, we're gonna call you Kel. This is from Kel. 12 week old Kavapu sleeps in the crate at night and during the day, but cries and howls when awake. Um, it sounds like he probably got a little bit of separation anxiety. So not only would I, all right, so the general consensus and it's something I've said on many of my shows is let them bark it out, let them do their thing. And yes, that's true, but there are ways you can help a dog. And this is gonna be for uh, Lady and Lucy's life. This is gonna be for any people that are comping that their dogs cry in the crate. There's a mentality that I want a dog to attain before putting them in the crate. If I have my dog, we're cuddling on the couch, I'm petting them, I'm loving on them, we're playing, and I put them in the crate. They're sitting there like, are you crazy? We just did all this play and I'm high energy. I just got all this affection and now I expect more of it, but you put me in the crate by myself and I'm gonna disagree with it heavily. Most of the time, that's a result of too much affection, too much play, 
too much free roam around the house. And the mentality we're trying to attain is tired and calm. So let me tell you how we break down our free time schedule, like our crate schedule with our free time window. Free time windows tend to be about 30 minutes to an hour and a half to two hours, depending on the age of the dog, the maturity level, and how long they can hold their bladder. But if I have a dog out of the crate, we break it down into walk and play first. Get some of that bigger energy out. Second is training. All the things that you can learn from the YouTube videos. If you're on our online school, you can pull a lot of that. If you're not on online school, check it out on puppycademy.com. We got a lot of great material there. And then after the training, we have something called supervised separation. And I cannot stress, guys, how important supervised separation is. It means we're in, we're in my living room right now. Welcome. I have my cot or like my bed, my place cot, my, my, wherever my bed is going to be. I have it in the corner of the room. Behind that, I have something that weighs a lot, significantly more than my dog by at least two times or one and a half times. And my leash is tied to that object. I give her enough slack, or her, he, her, whatever it is, enough slack to get to the end of that cot and maybe go maybe one or two steps past it. So they have like this like four or five foot bubble from where that leash is tethered. From where that place is, where that bed is, I am five to 10 feet away from it. If my leash on the tether is five feet, I'm 10 feet away. If it's four feet, I'm eight feet away. I need to be double the length of the leash away from the cot. Because what my dog will do is they'll sit on that bed, they'll look around, they'll get frustrated, they'll wanna move, and eventually they're gonna get frustrated enough to where they either bark, whine, cry, you adjust that, you handle it, you, uh, you deal with it, and then they eventually settle. This settle, is very, very important to us because this is them getting used to being independent, confident, and teaching their ability to self-soothe. These are all behaviors I want in the crate, but I introduce it outside of the crate to build confidence in that mentality. And then when they go to the crate, now I got a dog that's tired, relaxed, chill. I put them in the crate. Yes, they still have anxiety towards the crate. They're still gonna bark, they're still gonna whine, they're still gonna cry but all of it will be significantly less than what you dealt with the first time around. A couple other techniques you can do is, um, you can look up, uh, I think it's called puppy meditation on YouTube. We call it puppy meditation in our school as well. Or puppy calm crate pattern. Calm place pattern. The calm pattern means we take our place, which is place, sit, good, break. Place, sit, good, break. Place, sit, good, come. Place, sit, good, break. We take all those fast routines that work a dog into a, a driven, like a driving mode where they want to work really hard. We slow those down, walk them up the place, pause, they sit, good. That's my tone, by the way. It's not good. It's the opposite we want. Calm, not crazy. Good. Place. Sit. Good. Let's go or come or heal off a of place. Let's go, come or heal back to place. Sit, good. Place, sit, good. I am dead on the outside. There's a whole bunch going on inside, but what I show to them on the outside is calm and neutral. And eventually it's quite amazing. The reason what they call it puppy meditation is it's like you're meditating with your puppy. Because at one point they're gonna be like, and they're gonna mimic the energy that you're giving out. And at the end of that is when I put them in their crate because now you have a much calmer dog. And at that point, maybe you get a little bit of crying, but most of the time that crying will settle down after a third of the amount of time, a quarter of the amount of time, half the time. Any improvement is all I'm looking for. I am not looking for perfection in puppies. I'm looking for constant improvement so I can feed off of that improvement to kind of shape them into the dog that we want and the temperament that we need them to have. And then, other alternatives when they're in the crate. You can put a towel over the crate. It's hot guys though, so remember, you gotta give them a little bit of airflow. I tend to uncover the back of the crate, the back that's against the wall. I cover the sides and the front that they look out of. That front is the most important part, and most of the time when I talk to people, they're like, yeah, yeah, we cover everything but the front, because we want them to see. No, you don't want them to see. When they can see, they're constantly alert, awake, moving. They're looking for every little uh, source of movement. Second is put that crate as far away from the main living area as possible, if it's possible, and you wanna keep them away from it. It's like, if I have that crate in the living room with me, it's like me taking my, my sleeping bag to the main thoroughfare right outside our building, it's called PCH, Pacific Coast Highway. It's a highway, it's got a lot of traffic. Cars moving along it 24 seven. I put my sleeping bag there, there's no way I'm sleeping. I got constant movement happening. So 
put the crate in a quiet space, and then you can take it two steps farther. One step is get a white noise machine. Amazon, 10 bucks, blast it, top volume. That's not to drown out what the puppy's doing. That's to drown out everything outside the puppy's environment. We're walking around, clomping around on, with our feet, we're loud, we're obnoxious, and our puppy's like, I hear ya, and alert. This is to drown out that outside noise, and then take it one step farther. This is the final step. This is the big one. Amazon Alexa, Echo Dot, whatever the heck all those different things are. You just put some kind of speaker in that room with your puppy, go on YouTube, and play like a two-hour soundtrack of Friends, or Will and Grace, or Big Bang Theory. Will and Grace, what made me think of that? That's like the ancient show. Whatever, I watched it as a kid. Will and Grace, awesome. You wanna have some kind of noise. Friends is my favorite though, because they all love Phoebe. They love that nasally voice. It's like the jam. So give them something to listen to. Outside noise is drowned out. Inside noise is some kind of like podcast soundtrack. And they actually are stimulated by it, but it gives their brain something to lock on and actually will help them sleep, believe it or not. So that's just a couple solutions to help your puppy settle a little bit quicker. And I know that was a huge explanation, but I got like four crate questions and that's gonna handle all four of the crate questions. So anyone on here that asked a crate question, that is your answer to it. And a lot of our previous videos have a lot of crate conversations. We had a couple naysayers of the crate the last few weeks. So our previous videos are gonna address those naysayers and kind of give the other side of it. But when it comes down to it, guys, I'm not here to say you have to use the crate. I'm not here to crate shame you, whether you are or are not using it. Some people will need it, some people won't. The people that come onto my lives or uh, leave comments on my questions and hate it, great, good for you guys. Don't use it, that's fine. It's, this is, those videos aren't for you. These videos are for the people who are really struggling and need to leave for work for two, three hours and their dogs are destructive and they don't trust them outside of the crate, which most of my dogs I would not trust outside of the crate because they get into a cabinet, they eat chemicals, that's, that's the end for them. Like it's more for safety and puppy proofing than anything else. Uh, can you one day get off the crate? Yeah, of course. I default to place. When I'm home with my dogs, I don't do crate. I do place, two, three hours sometimes. When I leave, our dogs go in crates because it's safer for them. It allows them to sleep and rest more easily. All right, I'm done. I told you I was done. Okay. Alrighty, so this is from, I will address this one. I will, even though I said I wouldn't address any more crate questions because this is a little bit different. What if he go, this is from Gabby and Loki. What if he goes in there for naps on his own? I can latch it and walk around the house, no problem. But if I leave the house for five minutes, he goes nuts. He has pulled off three bars and also unlatched the door. So you guys know, metal crates are not like the Holy Grail. They're not Fort Knox. They can break out of a metal crate, but how they break out of a metal crate matters. So if they're pulling off the bars, they're hitting the crate hard enough, they can unlatch it, they can rip off those bars. You need something a little bit different. You need something called a impact crate, otherwise known as the Houdini crate. It is a pricey endeavor. They're about 450 to $500 for a large size one, for a large breed dog, 60 to 80 pounds, and they are expensive. However, they have plate metal on the sides with some breathing holes still, but they're small little, they're smaller and just more prevalent. And the crate is made like, it is literally Fort Knox of the crate world for dogs. You probably need to look into that. They do have, um, I think Kimberlin has a few of them as well. Kimberlin, uh, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-A-N-D. They make some impact crates that are plastic and about half the price. And they're like the hunting crates that people put in the back of like, SUVs or trucks when they take their hunting dogs out. So that's another cheaper alternative for you. Try it out. Most people, most dogs, most people, most dogs cannot chew out of those. So it's another alternative for you. All right. And this is from Cheryl Whitfield. I brought a new puppy home three weeks ago and my two-year-old dog no longer wants to cuddle with me or lay on the couch with me. It makes me so sad. I'm paying her a lot of attention, walks, car rides, etc., but she continues to ignore me. Any suggestions? Will this last forever? So you did the opposite of what you want to do. You paid more attention to her, so she's saying, well, I don't need to give you more. You're already giving me more. Don't give your dog affection for one week. <gasps> did he just say that? I did. I did say that. Cut, cut it back on affection. Your dog is basically saying, oh, I'm getting abundance of it, so why do I need to give any? I'm already getting everything I need. Cut back on affection for, that, for your older dog for a week, and that dog is gonna start looking for affection. But take it a step farther. Not only will it look for affection, it will start trying to earn more affection. When you're training your puppy, 
your older dogs didn't want to get training as well. So cut some of that affection and you'll have your dog wanting for more and looking to you as the source of affection. And honestly, it's a great relationship builder too. When you cut affection and your dog starts trying to earn it in different ways, they earn it by sitting by your feet and doing commands for you. They earn it by coming up and not just demanding affection, but sitting there calmly and being respectful. It's an amazing tool. It's uh, what I do for a lot of my separation anxiety dogs here in the program. If I got people that are like, no matter what I've done, the separation anxiety is terrible. I say cut affection for two to four weeks. It's not a negative, it's not a punishment. Everyone thinks it is. Affection is not a reward, it's a distraction. Just so you guys know, when your dog is in training mode and you give them affection for doing a good sit, I'm willing to put money on after you give that head rub for a sit, they stand up and they want more. They demand. Because you take them out of work mode, you put them in affection mode. So when you cut back on affection, they start looking to earn more things from you. So it's just something you guys can try out. And if it doesn't work, check back. We'll give you more solutions. There are no other solutions. It's that. That's the solution. Triana Murray. O'Brien. Turner. Wow, that's a, you got four names, girl. That's a lot of names. She's going to have four names too after we get married. <laughs> she commented, how does pick up at... How... I'm going to... I'm going to try to put this together. How to pick up a Connie Corso puppy that is 70 to 80 pounds. Build more muscle and good luck. I mean, I, I don't know. You got a big puppy. So if I got a big puppy and I can't pick him up, then you just don't pick him up. You can get ramps. You can train him to go up and down ramps into cars and things like that. But if your dog is 70 to 80 pounds and you don't have the physical strength to do it, then that's a physical strength issue. That's not a puppy issue. That's a, I need to find other alternatives. Um, I have one woman who's uh, 82 years old. She has a 185 pound burner doodle, 185 pounds. And she bought a hoist. I'm, I'm not BSing you guys. She bought an actual hoist. She puts the wrap under the dog's belly. It goes up the spine. It clips onto this huge metal hoist, like a huge hook and she hits a button and it lifts up the dog four feet off the ground. It's on a crane and it, she turns the crane to get the dog in the car, un, releases the hoist, it puts the dog back down, and then she unclips it, takes off the hoist, clips the dog into the bed of her truck with a four point police, or not police, but four point anchor point, like so the dog can't jump out of it and can't get hurt even if she gets an accident. The dog will be held in place by that four point like holding system. But that was her way of getting her dog in and out because eventually the dog got so big it didn't want to jump anymore. That's super common for big dogs. You use a hoist system, you use a ramp, you have a lot of different alternatives, but if you can't pick up the dog, then there's no way you can pick up the dog, physical strength wise. Yeah, that's a big dog. Kind of course a puppy's big. How much time do I got? I got, we started a little bit late. I'll go over a bit over. This is from Mac1234. Which dog cot do you recommend? So the ones we have at our facility are called K&H Pet Cots. I personally think they're very ugly, but we use them in a facility because they're facility cots. We have, I like them. Oh, they're horrendous. I they're, they are have horrendous. You seen, have you seen the pet cots out there? They're hideous. No, I'll tell you a great one right now. So the K&H ones, we use them at a facility because we replace them. Sparky? Because they're easy to replace and they're cheaper. They are definitely not cheaper. They're more expensive. I think they're horrendous. And they easily come apart so you can wash them and replace the canvas. The pet cot I'm going to recommend is a nicer version of the k &H pet cots. It's called Vihu. You found the Vihu. You, the Vihus are beautiful. I don't know what the Vihu is. That's the pet cots you buy me. So, but they don't come apart. Yes, they do. Completely. Uh, the Vihu pet cot is a much nicer pet cot. It's a thicker canvas material. They're incredibly beautiful. Check them out. Vihu Petcot, Elevated Petcot, and they're the only ones that I've seen online that actually have a chew-proof metal rim as well for the upgraded version. They're about $20 more per cot, and they actually have a metal rim lining it, so if your dog is a big chewer, they can't chew through that as well. So Vihu Petcot is my recommendation. If you want a cheaper solution, the K&H one also works really well. If your dog is chewing and you don't want, you don't want to buy the more expensive Vihu, then I would recommend the K&H because you can buy the canvas replacements. Vihu does not provide a canvas replacement. I will say that right now. What you got? That's Mabel's mom. She says hi. Hi, Candace. All right, moving on. We will have that debate later on. Oh, it's good. Okay, I like it. Good. 
All right, now from Lily, my puppy Pity. Oh, we love our pitties. My puppy Pity doesn't know boundaries when playing with other dogs. How can she learn without getting into a fight? You, you're the boundary. You need to help her. So most time when dogs are playing, uh, anyone who watches our Instagram story for puppy play, that is the best way for me to teach you how to intercede during play. So I tend to give puppies about 30 seconds to a minute of uninhibited play unless I see escalation like more growly, more vocal. Growling is not aggression. Growling is vocalism through overstimulation. Grabbing ears and pulling, that I don't like. Grabbing neck for and pulling and holding, that I don't like. When I get that jump off, bite release. This is how puppies play. But it's important that you guys regulate play by constantly or consistently finding your ways to separate play. How do I do that? I'm not gonna be like, ah, breaking it apart. I just simply intercede my body between. I walk through them, use my knees to kind of bump them apart a little bit, and then I keep going. They kind of split, go back to playing. But every time you split that play, you can de-escalate it. I'll be honest, most dogs that are young puppies can't play more than about five, 10 minutes. Five minutes is a really good window of play. And most people say, well, my dog can play for an hour, for 30 minutes. But what's the quality of play? Are they the ones breaking apart the play? Is one dog dominating the other one? The best form of play is like the wave hitting the shoreline. I know, that's like super hippy dippy, but I'm gonna use it. So imagine I got a wave and I have the shoreline. Play is when the wave hits the shore and then recedes, hits the shore, then recedes. One dog is jumping on the other, backs off. Other dog jumps on that one, backs off. It's a back and forth balance of play. Not every dog can play with every dog. A dominant dog shouldn't be playing with a submissive dog. A two crazy hyper crazy puppies shouldn't be playing until they break it apart. There should be human intervention to help them settle back down. Um, dominant puppy, submissive puppy, not isn't gonna work. You gotta find the right play group. Uh, I find that young puppies don't play well with older dogs because older dogs have a specific play style unless that older dog's incredibly well balanced. What I mean by that is older dog doesn't like the play and kind of comes up to mom and dad to help them to be like, hey, this crazy puppy's biting my ankle, I need help. The bad way that an older dog will put a dog down is they grab by the neck and body slam them and they stand over them and dominate them. That goes on the mentality of let them work it out. Do not let puppies let them work it out. The only ones who should be letting them work it out are dog trainers because they're not actually doing it. They're finding a window where it's becoming too intense and then splitting the two dogs apart. That's not what regular owners should be doing. You're not dog trainers. You need to constantly advocate for your puppies. That's the word I've been, I've been trying to remember. Advocate for your dog. Puppy gets advocated for when the older dog is beating it up. Older dog gets advocated for when the puppy is constantly going at him without any release. And two dogs playing together that are friends, five, 10 minutes, and you're like, I want them to play more, but they need a break. Just do that. Get in between them, have your leash. You step in between, you walk in your dog, you clip a leash on. Your other person, who's the owner of the other dog, walks in between their dog, backs them off, puts a leash on, and you do 10, 15 minutes of them being apart from each other. Great opportunity for place duration, putting them on the play scot for a prolonged period of time, have them hang out, let them settle, let them relax, and then reintroduce them to the group and kind of find the play style for them again. So it's all about advocating to help the puppy understand what's good play, what's bad play, what's too much, and what's too little. That's the big one. This is from Tris. I have a five month old puppy. When I walk him, he usually does great, but occasionally he'll start lunging and biting. What can I do? Um, five month old uh, breed does help me on this one because I need to know if it's like a drivey breed, German Shepherd, uh, Border Collie, herding dog. Like I, need, I, need, I, need to, I do need to know the breed on this one. Uh, and he'll start lunging and biting me. What can I do? I think that if you're on a harness, there's not much you can do except for being really firm with your body blocking. And by firm, that means you're stepping in and giving a hard knee bump to your dog. But that is not my solution to a baby. Five months old is not a baby. That's getting into the adolescence phase of puppyhood. Um, I would say you're probably ready for maybe a slip lead done as a figure eight. So like almost like a gentle leader type setup just to have a little bit of head control. Because when they start doing the biting, I'm walking my puppy 
do, 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 do. They start doing the jumping and biting and I kind of just put two hands on leash, extend up my arms away from me and lift and kind of lean away from them like that. They're gonna keep biting and by the way, their feet are not leaving the ground. I'm not stringing up my puppy. Not stringing up your puppy. You're just doing pressure out to the side, boom. And they're kind of like, in this position, but their feet are still on the ground. If their feet leave the ground, it's because they're forcing their head down to try to go back for your feet. Do not give slack. That is your moment to wait and pause and freeze. Still holding pressure and eventually they're gonna, yeah, they're just gonna go limp. Not because they're choking out, because they're done fighting. You've worked them through it. And that is when I take this motion and I go, easy, good. You don't have to say the easy, I just say the easy because I, I talk a lot. Slow pressure down, slow. And then they're gonna kinda take a breath. And they're gonna jump and bite you again right after that. Up, hold, fight, 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 and eventually they go limp, they settle. Good, slow down. If I do a hard lift, hard down, that's completely different. That's called a pop correction. That's more towards the balance training. That's not what we're, what we're looking for right now. That's not with your harness or your uh, gentle leader. Especially not your gentle leader because you can give the dog whiplash on their neck. It's a slow pressure hold, slow release, and that slow release allows their brain to release the tension, release the frustration, release some of that energy. That's a really big part of it. You're trying to calm your puppy down, not amp them up. You're not trying to give them a fight that they think they can win. You're trying to be stoic and neutral, allowing them to settle down so then you can help settle them down as well. I'm not sure I understand. Shut up, Siri. Stupid watch. All right. When to increase your puppy's potty times. This is one of our videos that we made and the video was when to increase your puppy's potty time. One of our people commented, three and a half month old Durbin, so a baby, this is not an adolescent. They don't even reach their first stage of adolescence, so usually four to six months. Doby, maybe we'll see, I don't know. My three and a half month, three and a half month old Doberman literally potties every 20 to 30 minutes like during, play, during playing hell squat. Like during playing hell squat? Like what? During Oh, you need a little little thingy in there. What the hell you call those things? All right, holds overnight, but potty training not going great. I see this a lot. Uh, how much water are you giving your puppy? I'm going to assume it's a lot. I'm going to assume you have free access on, to a bowl on the ground 24-7 because it's hot, and I get that. However, you need to give more frequent, uh, more frequent bowl, water bowl opportunities, but not free access to a bowl. Let me give you an idea of a measurement of water dogs need. Uh, this does not apply to Dalmatians. It doesn't apply to, uh, I believe, Weimaraners as well and a couple other breeds, but most of the breeds, like 99% of them, this will apply to. It's a half cup of water per 30 pounds of body weight every two to three hours, because I know everyone's got their pin because it's so valuable, I'll say it again. Half cup of water, per 30 pounds of body weight every two to three hours. This is how you increase potty hold time because most dogs are getting way too much water. A dog peeing every 20 to 30 minutes is probably getting quadruple if not five times as much water as they should be giving. Start regulating it. I say regulate it because when I say limit, I get hate comments and death threats. No, I'm just kidding, I don't. But they probably think about doing it because you're not limiting the water. You're just regulating when and how much they get at one time. If you're giving a good amount of water every two to three hours of the amount that I just told you, they're not dehydrated guys. You're still giving water just more frequent and less of it. That's the key. Dogs process water very quickly. They drink a bowl of water. They're peeing in 10, 20 minutes. So you got to help how much they actually intake at one time. I had one more point I was going to cross. Oh, and crate. Does it say we're crating here? I don't see anything about crating. So I'm assuming that you're not crating. And if you are, I apologize. Maybe I shouldn't make assumptions because it makes the ass out of you and me. But I'm going to slightly assume it. If you're not crating and your puppy is running around all day long, all the time, a dog in constant movement is a dog that has to pee frequently. It's like when I go work out and I drink a half gallon of water before my workout, I pee every 30 minutes. My personal trainer, he pees every 10 minutes because drinks a lot of water. But when you're moving, you're gonna have to go potty more often. When your dogs move, they have to go potty more often. So they probably need a couple hours of crate time 
30 to 45 minutes of free time. And every time they come out of that crate, they need to go outside for a potty. If they don't potty, they go back to the crate for 15 minutes, rinse and repeat until you get your potty. Limit your water to giving it to them. Oh, I said the bad word, I said limit. Manage, manage your water intake by only giving them water at the end of their free time. Give the amount that I mentioned per their body weight and then let them drink for about 10, 15 seconds. They stop and they kind of sit back, put it up on the counter. They don't need any more water than that. They're drinking what they think they need, not what, or they think, they drink what they think they need, but not actually what they need. It's more of a want, not a need. You have to help them understand what they need versus what they want. Just like anything. That's why puppies nip at us. They feel like they want to play that way, but they don't need to play that way. So we need to figure out their needs versus their wants. How much time we got? I'm doing one more. All right. This is from one of our videos going through your comment suggestions. What was good and what we'd skip? I'm skipping that because I don't understand that. All right, this is from Mercedes. I put my puppy in the crate at night and for naps during the day, he gets over town, bites a lot. I'm worried he will see it as punishment. Um, that is a great question. Not really a question, more of a statement, but I like it either way. So let's talk about my three strike rule. I love the three strike rule. Strike one is a firm no, and this is like for nipping, jumping, biting, not really pulling on the leash, not really walking, just for more in-home controllable things. My puppy's nipping at me and I'm like, no, I freeze. No, freeze. And my puppy's like, kind of gives me a weird look like, well, what do you want? Grab a toy when they're frozen, give them the toy, redirect them. I know, this isn't your question, I'm getting to it. Play with the toy for a couple seconds, let it go, let them self-play. Will this work every time? No, it works about 25-30% of the time, but it's still worth a shot. Strike two is the first strike did it work, so now we escalate to strike two. This is body blocking and spatial pressure. Puppy still jumping, still nipping. I put my arms like this, because I'm still on the ground with them. I go, no, and I do a bump. We are not striking our puppies, there's no hitting. It's a boundary reinforcement. You're advocating for your own space. This is my bubble out here, but my dog is within that bubble, so my arms are here, and then it's a firm no, bump, no, bump. And then in that bump, usually your puppy's gonna do this and look shocked, maybe even a little bit scared. Let's be honest, guys. These puppies have never had a scary thing in their entire lives, most of the dogs out there. So in that moment, it's not fear, it's surprise. They're surprised you're willing to escalate to their level and go one level above that. So it gets that moment of like, almost like shock. And in that window, young puppies under, I believe it's eight months, have an attention span of about 1.34 seconds and past adolescence, it goes up to about 2.34 seconds. That was a study I read like five years ago. In that 1.34 second time frame, you need to redirect to something else. No, pause, come, play, sit, down. No food yet. Come play, sit down. Still no food. Come play, sit down. Now they're tuned in. They're watching. Those eyes are locked on you. They don't remember the bad thing they did. All they remember is working for you. Good treat. Good treat. Good treat for all your different commands. Most time they just need something more fine-tuned because they don't know what to do with themselves. And when energy doesn't have a channel, come play, sit down, heal, drop it, leave it, fetch. Doesn't have a channel, it explodes like an atom bomb. Then you get nipping, jumping, pulling, biting. It's like the craziness comes out. What if that doesn't work? And there are times where it won't. There are a lot of times where all the pieces of advice I won't give you will work. This is when you know they need a nap. They're cranky, they're tired. Most puppies should be sleeping about 18 to 20 hours a day, full rim sleep. They're not getting that, they're cranky. This is where I want you to take a deep breath because you're right now angry. <sighs> take that breath, change your tone, change your body language, change your energy. Calmly walk up to your puppy, pick them up, or if they're my 80 pound uh, Conor Corso, grab the leash and I want you to calmly walk them to their crate. Put them in it, take off the leash, close it, lock it, cover it, turn on all your noise machines, and then walk out of the room. But a lot of people are still saying, yeah, but they did something wrong and I put them in the crate so it's obviously a punishment. No, it's not. If you don't say the word no, you're not angry, mad, frustrated. You're unemotional, you're neutral, and you put them in the crate. They're sitting there like, huh, what the heck just happened? I was biting mom and jumping on dad, and I know how much they love that, but then I ended up in the crate. Well, let me bark for 10 minutes, show my frustration. I didn't get addressed. I guess it's time for nap time. Remember guys, they're already tired, they're already cranky. 
So the crate is helping them rest and relax and recuperate whatever they've lost. So when they come out a couple hours later, they're like refreshed. They're ready, they're calm, they're relaxed. They wanna work, they wanna train, they wanna play, they wanna do all of the good stuff. But they need proper sleep time in order to accomplish that. Okay guys, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, any of the training that I mentioned, any of the commands that I mentioned, uh, we do have our online school, puppacademy.com, a little banner on top that has our online link. And we do meet every Wednesday at 4 p.m. for a whole extra hour, similar to this, but it's all face-to-face -face on Zoom and I answer a lot of questions. So if you do feel like you're struggling, you want more personal one-on-one -on -one time or like one-on-seven time, you guys should definitely check out the online school. And uh, until then, we'll see you next week. Have a great week, guys. Oh, wait, awkward smile time. I got to prep for it. <laughs>